Hey everyone, it's Dan Sparrow from TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Again, that website address is www.TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Got a question from this gal out in Florida. I don't know if she wants me to mention her name, so I won't. Sometimes it's kind of hard to tell if these people would rather remain confidential. But this is, um, this is a common question we get and one that we faced at South Coast in the past, at South Coast Clinical Trials which is my day job for the clinical trials um, outside of the clinical trials guru and it's how does a research clinic that normally conducts phase two through four studies get involved or start getting involved in phase one studies and so we're, obviously we're not going to focus on the business development as, as far as how to get these studies because that's a different topic and we've covered that before but this question was more along the lines of how do you set up a phase one study the build out, staffing, things like that. Very good question, very common question, and something that, again, myself and Don faced at South Coast Clinical Trials several times. First of all, you got to assess your current clinic. If you're doing outpatient studies, I'm assuming that you don't have the proper spacing in your current clinics to do an inpatient overnight phase one trials. So, what you will most likely need to do is rent either a hospital space, a nursing home facility space, a couple beds in a uh, locked unit. Usually these are nursing homes or out here in California they're called uh, IMDs. Um, and Don's going to do this video as well. He's going to cover the same topic. Basically you want a locked unit. You want it separated from the rest of the population there. So if you're doing it in a nursing home, ideally you'd like a separate wing just for yourself just for the phase one studies you gotta make sure that the male and female participants uh, are separated um, obviously you don't want people getting pregnant uh, this is especially true during psychiatric trials where sometimes the population is a little hypersexual and it's a serious issue if somebody gets pregnant during a clinical trial it's a big deal um, so you gotta make sure there's things like that taken care of as far as logistics. You also want to make sure that the food menu um, that they could accommodate. First of all, you want to make sure that the facility that you're renting out beds from or renting out space from for the clinical trial can facilitate, first of all, having food there. Sometimes they don't do that or sometimes they'll charge you more. Um, if they don't provide food services, you're gonna to have to do that yourself and that's a separate contract with another vendor that you're gonna find what we like to do at South Coast Clinical Trials is make sure that the nursing home or the hospital or whomever it is that we're contracting the unit out from to do our phase one studies provide food and then if they do so how many times a day what type of food do they um, do they have special menus for people with diabetes or things like that is the food is the food um, compliant with the protocol are they gonna be given food at certain times of the day can they get food whenever they want these are important things you gotta figure out based on the protocol uh, sometimes you're not allowed the study participants not allowed to eat half an hour one hour two hours before a blood draw you gotta make sure that everyone's on the same page and oftentimes the more of these kind of things that you outsource to third party vendors like the hospital or the nursing home, they're not going to know what your protocol is all about necessarily. So you're either going to have to have a manager from your clinic there staying on top of these kind of things um, or the person who, who you're delegating this to is going to have to get familiar with that protocol because there's some serious logistical concerns um, around even simple things such as food. So you got to think about that. Then you got to think about whether you need a locked unit. In most psych studies, you need a locked unit. If you're just doing a healthy volunteer study, you still want to have limited access. You know, you're not keeping the people locked in against their will or anything, but there's certain rules as to when you can leave and when you can't. And because you want to control what that person's doing for the purposes of the protocol, you can't just let them leave and check in a few times during the day because you want to 
you want to have control as to what they're doing. Uh, you don't want them out there using drugs or, you know, doing things that the protocol may not allow for. Then, for these phase one studies, there's a huge issue regarding blood draws. The blood draw in an outpatient study is relatively simple. They're usually done one or two times during the visit, at the most. Sometimes there's zero blood draws during a visit for a phase two through four outpatient study. In an inpatient study, it's a lot different. There's usually blood draws every couple of hours, and you need a sufficient staff there doing that. You need sufficient staff familiar with the protocol. Furthermore, there's, e there's even bigger logistical issues such as when to dispense the investigational product or the study drug, and then when to draw the blood based on when they receive the study drug. And then there's ECGs, PK samples, lots of things like that. Those are all protocol issues. But I think what your question was mostly about the big picture type thing. How does, an, uh, how does a, a clinical trial company that normally conducts outpatient studies get involved in inpatient studies? And the answer would be the biggest issue is finding the appropriate space. And, you know, whether you have that yourself or whether you need to contract that out from someone else and then um, arranging a deal, arranging a contract with the, with the unit for the space, and then working out all the logistical issues with your vendors, such as food, phlebotomists, technicians who do the ECGs, pharmacists, doctors. Oftentimes you need staff there 24 hours. You need to be supervising your study participants when they're on their overnight visits, and usually the hospitals or the nursing homes or the facilities that you're running out the space from, they'll have people there. But it's not just enough to have people there. You need to make sure these people are familiar with the protocol and that they understand what they are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do because it's not, a clinical trial is very different from someone who's staying in a nursing home because they need to be in the nursing home. A clinical trial participant who's in that unit should be, um, treated differently, um, obviously, and a lot of times the staff at these places are not very familiar with clinical trials, so you're going to have to find a way to have some kind of quality control as far as executing the protocol. But hopefully this helps as far as equipment and things like that. I mean, you're going to need a little bit, um, a little more equipment than you would probably be used to at an outpatient study but the biggest issues are the logistical issues and making sure you stay compliant with the protocol and stay compliant with how you dispense the study medication. Hopefully this helps. Um, I didn't have a script during this video so I may have missed some important things and that's why I'm going to ask Don to make a video on the same topic as well. So hopefully between the two of our videos you'll have enough information to at least get you started. Let me know if you have any other specific questions and uh, we'll see what we can do. This is Dan Sfera from TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Thanks a lot.